Thank you all for coming. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And welcome what welcome to what turns out to be the first IAS Thursday of the second semester. And I'd uh, like to open um, today's event. Sorry, we're trying a new toy here. Um, I'd like to open today's event by just remembering that the land we are on is the homeland of the Dakota people. And the IAS acknowledges that we are newcomers to this land and that we respect it in um, honor and respect of the Ojibwe and the nations in this area. Um, I want to remind people who might be interested that um, the IAS is taking applications for the um, Mellon Foundation's John E. Sawyer Seminar, and those applications are due on February 20th. You can get more information at um, the ias.umn.edu website, and you can find information about all our other programs on there. We have a lot of interesting programming in addition to IS Thursdays going on this spring, and that information can be found there. Um, next week, IAS Thursday, again, will be in this room, same time, same place, hopefully without the same weather. And um, the, our speaker will be Rick Prellinger, who is a writer, an author, a, a filmmaker, a writer, an author, hmm, a writer, a filmmaker, and, uh, and an educator. And he, um, I don't know if any of you have ever used his collection of videos and films for teaching. Um, they've since been acquired by the Library of Congress. And he will be talking next week on uh, the romance of obsolescence and the promise of hybridity. Um, OK, so a couple of announcements about today's talk. First, please admire the gorgeous artwork, which is about by a local artist, Ricardo Levins Morales. And the quote that is, uh, that is the foundation of the artwork is from Peter Rathbun, who is the director of the Eastside Freedom Library and a labor historian. Um, we are going to shorten today's program because we know there are people who will probably want to rush home uh, and it's going to be a slow process to get there. So we're going to stop at 4.30. This will probably have the effect of cutting off um, important discussion. If people are interested, we are happy to reschedule another discussion. And there's a sign up sheet. So this is, uh, we also have uh, Harold Paul just suggested further reading. Yes. Yeah. We would like to keep this conversation going. So you can grab one of these on your way out. They're also up on the Great, thank you. Um, and, uh, and I want to also thank our co-sponsors for today's event, this, um, the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change, the Race, Indigeneity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Initiative, uh, and the Departments of Anthropology, English, History, Philosophy, and Psychology. So thank you all for coming. Um, our panelists today are, um, and you guys can just like wave your hand when I, when I introduce you so people will know. Tom Wolf is Associate Professor of History and Affiliated Faculty with the Department of Anthropology, the Institute for Global Studies, and the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. Uh, Salim Rauer is a PhD candidate in the Department of French and Italian, focusing on Francophone and French post-colonial literature and drama, European post-war theater aesthetics, and French politics. Andrew schumacher Bethke is a PhD candidate in the History Department. His dissertation is on British India in the late 19th and early 20th century, and looks at the intersection of conservatism, colonialism, and aesthetics. Mikhail Vaz <coughs> is a PhD candidate in the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature and faculty <coughs> in the School of Music. His research centers around themes of history, space, and place, and technology and media. And last but not least, Patrick Wilkes is a PhD candidate in the history department who studies 20th century transnational media history in the US and Britain. And his dissertation grapples with the relationship between print journalism and new technology and explores the social, cultural, and political dimensions of computerized na computerizing national newspapers in New York and London from the 1970s to the 1990s. So thank you all for coming. And Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Greetings, everyone. Maybe I think the goal right today is that we want uh, you know what goes through the snow thinking about something. <laughs> and, and why do you keep your eye on the ice? You can also be thinking. 
Um, this it got together very quickly. So um, just what is it? A teach-in seems like an open category. And so um, I think we, maybe a year ago when this idea came up, it was maybe going to be a little different than what it's turned out to be. And certainly we didn't imagine the snow that uh, we have now. But I think the, the idea is that, I, and I think what we all share, right, is that there's some interesting things happening in the world that's good to think about. And it, one has to think about both the events and the rhetorics around the events. Uh, I would admit, of course, that in the case of America's own public life, right, there's what's been so disturbing lately is the, the tone, the virulence, the, the low quality of speech and assertion that we hear every day, the kind of callousness of feeling that we hear in the, in, in our, uh, from our, some of our leaders, um, the demeaning of others' dignities, the assertion of vast, uninformed, and callous judgments about entire groups of people, um, <clears throat> this ignorance and insens insensitivity is also expressed in policies. And we're, in a way, watching at this moment you know, our gov the American government with certain policies. But of course, one of the observations that we were making is that this is not just about America, that this, there's a worldwide scale that, there's, that it's important to think about. <clears throat> so whenever I feel this kind of anger and confusion, I always remind myself that the first thing to do, the first thing to think about, the first thing to remember is that my sense of the world comes from my interactions with the media. And what do I mean? The large, you, I think you all know, right? The large institutions that beam us both curated and uncurated information about what is supposedly happening in the world. And we should remember, right, that, that our media channels do not give us a rounded, accurate, dispassionate image of reality. Uh, it doesn't give us a, a clear picture of reality of our own society, and it certainly doesn't give it a clear picture of other societies. When we interact with the media, we need to keep in mind always the incompleteness of its productions, right? its partialities, and the truth that any one picture is a fragment of a much larger picture. So that whenever we feel we have a kind of fixed on a good explanation of something, we have to think, wait, is that enough? Is that the whole picture? And secondly, it's important to remember that the university is not the media. And that's a very useful thing to think about. And it's, in fact, a place from which to think about the media and the world. Better understandings of contemporary movements come from sustained, slow analysis, slow thinking, which is what the university can do. It doesn't always do, but it can do. So today, you have mostly some historians in front of you who have something to say about this condition of democracy in the world. And I'm going to start off by saying, basically, making suggesting two things, two very simple things. I think first, we should be really careful when we use historical analogies and when we intentionally or unintentionally draw historical parallels, when we dip into the past and use some event from the past to explain the present. Secondly, we should, what we should do is grab useful concepts that accurately name phenomena. That should be our go-to. That should be the stuff with which we think, not necessarily the historical stuff. So more specifically, I want to explain today my sense that the truly horrible eras of the 20s and 30s in Europe, in Europe does not furnish useful parallels. But also that we do have key terms that we need to lean on, that we can serve, use as a basis for our thinking. So I'm going to talk about fascism and not, Nazism, but I'm also going to talk about populism and demagoguery, a demagogue. What is a demagogue? And as a kind of first take into this, I want to just remind everyone that of a very important fact, right? The democratic systems have always been scenes of contestation, conflict, because democratic systems exist as a way of negotiating and managing pluralities of views and interests. Most democracies have built-in systems of self-scrutiny even if they appear slow and unwieldy. One other general observation to be made at the beginning is that democracies can, democracies can be said to be strong when the vast majority of citizens understand that <coughs> the most virulent conflict does not put the system at risk. If no party in the conflict looks to the destruction of the system itself as a way of ending an argument. So fascism. 
Uh, you've likely heard this term thrown about in the context of our passionate conversations in the present moment. One hears this word. Since the 20s, it's been the word used on the left to condemn, uh, it's, it's been one of the strongest possible labels for those on the left or the side of the spectrum to use in denunciations of people on the right. So as soon as the phenomena appeared, it became a term wielded by those on the left against the right. To call someone a fascist is, it was, not just to assert that they're your opponent, but it was to say, you are beyond reason, you are beyond discussion. So where does this come from? Let me just remind you all where this word fascism comes from. It comes from the early 20s, and it was an ideological movement led by Benito Mussolini uh, after World War I. What was fascism? The best definition I have of it is by Roger Griffin, the one I like is, it's a form of palingenetic ultranationalism. Now, what does this mean? Ultranationalism, that's pretty clear, right? Ultra is very, extremely. Refers to an obsession with the nation's faith, right? Not, not an obsession about church, about religion, about language. It's about an obsession about the nation. What is palingenetic? It means referring to rebirth. The reconstruction and return of a nation based on the idea of bringing back some kind of ancient, ancient uh, authenticity. In the 20s, this was used by Mussolini to refer to ancient Rome and the glories of ancient Rome. This is the explicit reference. The word refers to a Roman, a Latin word meaning bundle of sticks, which was a symbol for the Roman uh, Empire. Mussolini constructed himself and projected himself as a kind of emperor figure with clear relationships to you know, uh, carvings and bas-reliefs uh, in Rome that he saw all around. Together, these terms go together, and they imply an ideology of extreme nationalism that's, a, that's based on a reestablishing of ancient greatness on the basis of resurrecting ancient sources. Just to remind you about the context, Mussolini developed this in the aftermath of World War I, when he saw, uh, and what he saw was the inadequacy of both the liberal democratic and the social communist responses to the crisis that Italy faced after the war. Italy was basically ungovernable <coughs> between 1918 and 1922. Um, he thought these two groups were responsible for the crisis. In 1922, the king asked Mussolini to, to take over, and he quickly passed, passed mer emergency decrees that enabled him to establish a regime that was sort of embodied his view. Now, don't forget, how did he establish his presence in Italian society? Through violence. It was the, and the threat of violence. His followers terrorized the opposition. Thousands of people, tens of thousands, terrorized anybody who they thought was on the other side. They stayed in power via real and, and threatened assassinations. Many people were assassinated, politicians, governors, judges. Everyday intimidations in the streets, uh, bombings, street battles, fights constantly. Opposition newspapers were burned, trashed, um, and, and uh, their uh, property was confiscated. The fascist government review, removed all bureaucrats and officials who had anything critical to, to say about Mussolini. And this was all in the name of putting an end to chaos. So chaos was caused and then put an end to. So you know that this movement was very appealing to a short, well, medium height, I guess, Austrian corporal. Um, in, after World War II, who wanted to make his own party in Munich in the early 20s. This was Hitler, of course, and this was the National Socialist Party. Um, Mussolini was Hitler's uh, uh, hero. Uh, just like Mussolini's black shirts, the Nazi party consisted of, consisted of tens of thousands of ex-soldiers who, who were just as violent as the black shirts in Italy. They used this violence to intimidate people, to, to, to start con conflicts and then to sort of end them with violence. We should remember that um, Germany and Italy were both very new countries. Democracy was a sort of odd thing. It, in, the democracy, in the form that we would think of it today, it only went back to the Weimar Republic in 1919. So Germ Germany democracy was new. Um, Hitler's party was like Mussolini's except for two things, very important things. The first was, at its core was anger and resentment at the fact of Germany's defeat. Remember, 
Italy is so strange because Italy won the First World War. They were on the winning side, and yet society sort of unraveled. Germany lost the First World War, and that defeat generated immense anger and, and, and frustration and revenge. And Hitler explained this by saying, well, there must have been a reason we lost that war, and the, because it wasn't military. We didn't lose it on the battlefield. We lost it in the politics, the politics. That's where we lost it. And who lost it? The Jewish politicians and, and intellectuals. And that's the second difference. Um, the Nazis had, a, the Nazis, unlike the Italians, couldn't claim a kind of source of ancient greatness. Like there was no great ancient, you know, Aryan emperor that, that um, you know, created this vast literature and philosophy that we know of today. These were um, Teutonic tribes out of the forests. Um, they couldn't look back to this glorious era, but they could look back and imagine a history of a warlike, honorable, heroic people that they imagined as the Aryan people. And there was enough evidence for this that they thought, okay, I mean, we can kind of work with this. And so a kind of fiction, mythology about this Aryan people was established um, that served as the, as the kind of core from which the race Racial, racial science emerged. And the racial science taught them that this Aryan group was at the top of society and everywhere else there's a hierarchy of races uh, with Hitler at the top. And the problem with Germany is that it had been contaminated. The problem was to purify Germany and that would enable the Aryan people to um, come back to the top. You know the rest of the story, 1933, uh, Hitler copies Mussolini's playbook, but as uh, Mussolini's sort of control and control of the processes in Italy starts to fade. Hitler starts to take over the whole Axis movement. Um, the uh, persecution of the Jews turns into the final solution during the war. It's worth stressing that these two megalomaniacs were able to gain power through widespread and constant political violence and the creation of a pervasive and very public culture of fear that was per pervasive. The fascists said that they, they owned the streets. So if you went on the street, the fascists wanted you to think about it, uh, to be aware of that. Um, remember, again, as I said before, Germany and Italy had, the Germans and Italians had very little, the word democracy was a kind of odd word, it, in, in the, even in the 20s and 30s. Um, the mass of Germans and Italians were not that familiar with it, not that familiar with the kind of routine me mechanisms of democratic government. Um, they, these were societies where political disagreement was itself seen as a problem to be overcome and not as inherent in the system. So uh, they turned out not to be, these regimes turned out not to be conservative, but actually quite radical in the rejection of the elite's point of view. Um, why do people today speak so positively about fascism? I mean, one hears people like Steve Bannon will say, oh, you know, and in Italy, you know, this sense of fascism wasn't good. I mean, in, in Germany, of course, you're not allowed to say, oh, that, that, those Nazi years, those were great years. That's not allowed. But in Italy, you can say, oh, yeah, fascism, that was, those were good years. Um, you know, this is a huge topic, and, and I would just throw out that I think that it's, uh, uh, it gives people like Steve Bannon uh, the fiction to say what was so wonderful is that it embodied a fantasy of efficient government. That government was most efficient if it wasn't contested. So if the people in power could just do what was necessary, then, then um, the government, then this was a good kind of government. Um, of course, people like Bannon forget, of course, that this vaunted efficiency came from public powerlessness. The public had no real say in how this government was going to evolve. But it was a kind of fancy, fantasy of efficiency and, and, and such. Um, so I, I want to suggest that you know, these, this moment is, is distant, and that there are much more immediately and useful uh, terms that we could use to operate with that, that would help us analyze our moment. Uh, and not just in America, but all over the world. Not, of course, not that that history is unimportant, right? Of course, it's vitally important to remember that history, because there's a kind of evidence in that moment of just the, the kind of how deep humanity can sink. 
and, and, and also the, the institutional mistakes and misjudgments. So there is, some, of course, something to study there. But I would say that um, it's much more important in our moment to think about the ways to use terms that help us understand the organic workings of democratic societies, as opposed to the systems of single party dictatorships. So I'm saying let's think about the organic workings and not the system. So it's essential, I think, that we talk clearly about the state of public life and public culture in societies with democratic regimes. So there's many terms that we could try out here and that we'll hear from, I bet. So I just want to talk briefly in the, the 10 minutes left about populism and demagogue. Why are those two words so great? What is populism? Well, I mean, we have a sense of what it means, right? It's pretty, we, we live with this term to some degree, right? This is a term that refers to political movements that, came, that, come, that claim to speak on behalf of a certain group of people, to express their will and to pursue their interests. Populist movements usually come from people outside the traditionally or excluded, uh, uh, from, from people traditionally outside of or excluded from the normal space of politics. They're often, populist movements are often about the poor, which can be a lot of people in some countries. Uh, they often assert the power of numbers against the smallest of elites. A populist movement often crystallizes around small numbers of issues that then fuel energy and activism. But they break apart when the, when the problem is perceived to have gone away or to, or to have been solved in some way or addressed. Populist movements are often inward looking. They're sort of forced inward looking and they're plagued by questions of membership and leadership. The danger for them from such a movement is that people can join the group, but the more people that join, the more diffuse the aims can be. Some populist movements have strict criteria for membership as in small ranchers and uh, small farmers and ranchers on the plains of the Midwest, while other definitions are vaguer and more elastic, like President Nixon's silent majority. Political movements, uh, populist movements appeal to common sense, and they're often distrustful of experts and expertise. There's no single ideological content to populism. It can uh, be left or right. Uh, but the power comes in this ability uh, to have numbers behind it. So what should we keep an eye on? What should we ask? Well, we should always ask, who constitutes this people? Who constitutes this populist uh, collectivity? How does the group define who's in and out? How porous are the members' boundaries, is the movement's boundaries? What kind of cause serves as the glue that holds a populist movement together? Are its grievances well understood, or are they pretty vague and abstract? Are the arguments about government and society based on analysis and experience, or does the populist group base its energy on uh, prejudice? What's the nature of its leadership? And certainly, so given this account, um, it should not be, you should remember that populism and democracy have always been sort of co-constituted. It's not like there, we've ever seen a kind of pure, the populist movements arise in democracies and in a sense, democracies are, are petri dishes where this, this uh, activity happens. And we should not be surprised, right? Because the word demos means people, and populus in Latin means people. And so this is a, both somehow about the people, a self-consciousness about people acting in the, in the political world. Um, the difference is, of course, that democracy, the demos of democracy, refers usually to an idea of citizenship, that there, you belong because of citizenship. Whereas populist, the people of populism could belong for any set of attributes. What about the word demagogue? Well, in, in, in Greek, it has a kind of basic meaning, which is just leader of the people. But even back then, the Greek Democrats and the fifth century Athens or whatever, we're quite aware of the difference between the people as the good people like us, as opposed to the mob. And so the term was that demagogues came to mean then leader of mobs. And that's the term today, right? It's an overwhelmingly negative term today in English, right? This is, refers to a political leader or agitator who appeals to passions and prejudices to obtain power. They appeal to the supporters in ways that draws attention to their own abilities and talents, 
for example, they spend enormous time on their own physical appearance because they understand that's what makes an impression. And that's their goal often is to make an impression. They come in all sizes and shapes, all hair colors. They speak many different kinds of political dialects. Some are left, some are right. Some use overt <coughs> racial language. Others vary their racial attitudes deep down. Some care about law, some don't care about law. Some say things as long as they know that someone somewhere will like it. They often claim that what makes them special is that they're willing to say what others are too afraid to say. That's an important ground for a demagogue. And of course, populist movements can be incubators for demagogues, right? But populist movements can also criticize demagogues and reject them. This is particularly the case on the left. So a constant discourse in leftist discourses, to be afraid, to, to recognize our leaders among us who are just a little too uh, eager to you know, take, take power. Um, because demigods construct their support on the basis of their own style, they don't care that much about actual government. Demigods are also in constant tension with the slow bureaucratic procedures of institutions. They also suffer from the fact that a certain portion of the population is resistant to demagogic appeal. So what should we ask what should, when we think we know this demagogue, which we might these days, uh, what kinds of questions should we be asking ourselves? Well, obvious ones. What's, what's the nature of this appeal? What is, what is happening in this act of attraction? What special language or codes are being used? How does the demagogue interact with the system's institutions, if at all? What are the institutions that stand behind the support and support the demagogue? And under what circumstances might that relationship weaken? What are the institutions that stand inherently opposed to the demagogue? What issues are out there that have the power to reveal the weakness of demagogues? At what point does the appeal of the demagogue begin to atrophy? <coughs> what is the demagogue's relationship to his allies or her allies? How does he or she, although the whole gender thing is fascinating, no time to go into it, um, collect around them people with actual experience of governing? So the demagogue needs governors, but how? Does he or she have a clear idea of why he's seeking power or she? So in conclusion, it does seem indeed that sometimes the mixtures of political life around the world that we receive through our usual media channels do seem to justify the question, is democracy in crisis? And yet to me, my opinion is that this is not a helpful question. Because if we, if there, it implies that there's a situation we could construct in which dem democracies would not be in crisis or would be in control of every crisis. And I'm not sure that's right. And um, we're in which situation we, in which we find ourselves now it would be impossible. Right? For a system to be safe from crisis would be, require a source of authority to guarantee this, a source of power that would have to somehow lie, stand above the political system to possess more prestige than the system itself. This source of power could also put democracy in question even more virulently than it already is. They could decide when democracy became too chaotic or disorderly. What we have to do is keep close watch on the populist option of the day and cast unforgiving light on dem demagogy. Um, this means realizing above all the specific ways that the idea of democracy is realized in any given place, having to do with how long it's existed, what its history is, because China's not Russia, not Brazil, not Italy, which is India, which is not Britain. So that's the level at which I think it's so productive to sort of analyze things. So turn it over to these guys. These are experts. You want to go in this order? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the nation of Denmark. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Miguel, and I, I am Danish. I come from Denmark. And like, I guess that's uh, why I've been asked to say a little bit about, about these things and in that context. I can also speak a little bit to some of the other Scandinavian countries if, uh, if people want to uh, know more about that. Um, and um, I have a couple of short answers for uh, you know democracy in crisis, racism, um, fascism. Um, is there a significant movement of fascism uh, and we might add demagoguery, uh, I guess, uh, 
to it in, in Denmark and the, the Nordic countries? I want to say no. There is you know, a rising but still fringe-like fascist grouping in, in, in countries like Denmark, but by and large, we don't see a lot of actual fascism up in the streets. Um, is there significant racism, discrimination, and we could add populism maybe to that? Um, in Denmark and the Nordic countries, I, I want to suggest the answer is yes, very much. Um, and then um, a little analysis. Um, and this maybe also will resonate with um, the, a lot of the press coverage that my, uh, my nation has received recently in, in America. There's lots of talks of the wonderful social democracy that we have in, uh, in my country, uh, which I in many ways think we, we should be proud of. Uh, and this is also the thing uh, around which these questions uh, revolve, uh, the question of the welfare state. Um, which is imagined as being particularly Danish and consisting of particularly Danish values. Um, so everything, um, as, as, as Tom also points out, uh, is uh, a question of who is in and out and who gets to benefit from this welfare state. Uh, foreigners are branded as burdens or attackers of this welfare state and uh, we must understand the Danish values that are particular to something like a welfare state. Um, this also then draws attention away, uh, at least this is my analysis, from the vast neoliberal uh, erosion of the actual welfare state. And we see this in a country like Denmark, also in the unholy alliance between the far-right anti-immigrant parties and the more mainstream right parties. Basically what you see is a little uh, tit for tat where the uh, mainstream governing right-wing parties, they get to get their uh, neoliberal reforms through parliament, and in exchange, they pass a very hard anti-immigration uh, law so that the uh, uh, far right-wing, which does claim to be defenders of the welfare state, but in actual fact will uh, vote for vast um, erosions of the welfare state. And then just a few examples. Um, you may have heard about the uh, small island that uh, the Danish government has decided to place a group of rejected asylum seekers on. The uh, argument is that um, we want to make it as horrible for these people <coughs> so that they understand by their living conditions that they should go home. So the parallel is basically make it worse than Syria because then maybe they'll go back to Syria. Um, do we see restrictions in uh, access to these welfare goods. Again, um, you know, these are people attacking our welfare, so we must restrict it. Um, it also, by the way, ends up uh, hitting people like me, expat foreigners who live abroad, uh, quickly are cut off from uh, these kind of welfare goods. And uh, if I return home, I think it will take me up to a decade to regain all those welfare goods. Um, of course, we see it in anti-Muslim laws, uh, of course, you know, veiled under more liberal rhetoric, but we have now a law against headscarf, basically. We also have now in an official citizenship ceremony, which requires that you shake hands with a government official. Uh, of course, very much targeted against uh, Muslim women, and apparently, you know, it's very symbolic politics. I think someone did a statistic, and there are there is a guess that it's like two people a year or something like that that actually would have an issue with this. But yeah, we have this kind of uh, law. And then uh, cases like widespread bafflement and critique and, and derision and ridicule of cases of um, uh, whiteness and privilege that are not really imagined as such in Denmark. So um, one of my main fields of study is, is music. And there was a case recently of someone pointing out that a good Danish song that we have contains the lyrics, the Danish song is a young blonde maiden. And someone said, well, you know, not every Dane is a young blonde maiden. Um, and this became, like, the prime minister got involved, and it was the subject of widespread ridicule um, in the Danish media. So we see this on so many different levels, from very hard politics to the softer politics. Um, and could we slide into demagoguery? 
like in Hungary or something like that with Orban, maybe down the line. But I actually would suggest that part of the problem is that we're not actually there yet. Um, and I will take my remarks there. Um, so there's sort of a couple of main threads that I wanted to talk about um, sort of involved in the ways that colonialism especially kind of complicates our understanding, right, of this idea of democracy and crisis. Um, and so one of the first things I wanted to, I think, <coughs> I, somebody really, sorry, was really, people really wanted me to talk about Modi. I'm not an expert in any way on right, contemporary Indian politics. I'm not going to pretend to be. That would be ridiculous. Um, but that is sort of related to one of the threads that I want to talk about, which is, um, right, I think that there is still this interesting narrative, interesting, interesting, it's not interesting, it's terrible, right, terrible narrative of, right, sort of third world nationalism or populism, um, right, where these sort of figures are cast together, right, in a way that is incoherent and absurd, right, that like Chavez and Modi and, right, Bolsonaro were mentioned in the same breath as though they're not wildly opposed political figures, um, right, and what it, of course draws them together is that they are from formerly colonized countries. Um, What's interesting, I think, right, is what's left out are, right, it's, I think there's this assumption in the Western media, right, even to some degree in Western academia, right, that they are meaningfully connected, right, because of their status, right, as these sort of non-Western subjects, right? There's something about the non-Western, right, that trends towards this kind of populism, right, or sort of absurd anti-liberal feeling. Um, and what's left out, right, are the ways that colonialism has really complicated, right, the democratic narrative. Um, and so, right, I mean, to make a connection, right, sort of to contemporary Indian politics, right, the ruling party, the BJP, right, their sort of spiritual organization, right, the RSS, um, which is a sort of Hindu nationalist organization um, that has existed since 1902, I believe, um, has a really complicated relationship with the Indian state in a number of incarnations, right? It was first banned by the British which would sort of set it up as, right, this kind of independence organization, right? It's a counterpose to colonialism, right? Perhaps it's a good thing. Then, of course, right, I mean, the next major ban was, right, an RSS member was responsible for the assassination of Gandhi, which doesn't really fly with this question of, right, the democratic anti-colonial narrative, how do we fit that in, right? And now, of course, right, I mean, they are directly tied to the ruling party. Um, right, I mean, so what I'm trying to say is, right, I mean, this clear line, line of this group, right, this historical narrative, doesn't fit with what we would think that it perhaps would, right, if we were trying to draw this kind of coherent, rational narrative of, right, democracy and decolonization, right, and good and bad, right, in a very sort of liberal sense, right, good politics, bad politics. It doesn't really work because, right, the politics of colonialism don't actually map onto, right, in a way that we would maybe like it to, um, right, the politics of liberalism. Right, there isn't sort of this idea, right, that all opposition to colonialism must then also be, right, good liberal politics for all the good people, right, or that these groups are coherent, um, right, or are coherent rather, right, I mean, they're not, or they are coherent and it just doesn't map onto the expectations of what we'd like them to. Um, I think this is also sort of related, um, in some ways, I was thinking about this, hopefully we're all uncomfortably thinking about this, right, that this panel on democracy and crisis of these experts of global democracy, right, I mean, it's by remarkably similar looking people. Um, um, and, right, which I mean is perhaps all the more questionable because I don't actually think it was planned. It never is, right. Um, and, right, just somehow. Um, and I think, I mean, that also, right, is this interesting, right, I mean, I think it comes up with, when we think about populism and demagoguery, right, and all these things, that requires this kind of touchstone, um, right, that in the colonial, right, it's all the more complicated in the colonial context, right, to a colonial historian or to anyone who's not a white European or American, right, it's abundantly clear that this touchstone is really complicated because I think what we tend to do is not really unpack the concept of democracy, right, that it's not Right. We love to tease out the Greek meaning of this as though it's not an ideology, right? And it is an ideology, right? It's a very clear ideology. And again, right, to go with the sort of complicated colonial lineage, right, of anti-colonial but also anti-liberal sort of feeling, you know, it's also important to keep in mind, 
right? These touchstones have often obscured what they have done that is damaging, right? And so we talk about, right, I mean, we can talk about, you know, right, Italy and, and Germany were new democracies, but the question, of course, is what democracy hasn't actually done terrible things, right? I mean, the mother of all parliaments is responsible for some of the most atrocious, right? I mean, you know, a killing arguably more people than the Nazis, right? The British, if you consider, as one maybe should, right? Various Indian famines as at least partially their responsibility. Um, right, and I think this raises the question, right? I mean, one thing that we have to consider, right? If this system of democracy, right? If this ideology, this liberal sort of order, is what's in crisis, this is not to say, right, that hard right demagoguery, right, is necessarily a better option. It is to say that what we should take from history, right, in addition to the usual questions, right, of asking these figures who are popping up, is also, right, meaningfully interrogating why, right? And one of those questions, I think, right, has to involve looking outside of sort of the traditional comfort zones, right? Because that also gives us insight into the, right, into the interior, right? I mean, again, to go back to the British, they got to their position in the late 19th century by exploiting three quarters of the world, but of course, they got to the position of being able to do that by exploiting their own working class before that. Um, right, and this came from, again, right, this kind of the beginnings of this liberal system. And so, when we ask this question of crisis, right, I think the point that I would make as a colonial historian is we really, really have to consider this crisis, what is the crisis is perhaps us witnessing what has always been wrong, right, and having a chance to meaningfully look at that and interrogate that. So we'll leave that there, and then we'll learn about it. Yeah, it's a great setup, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about England, and I think that if you're talking about a crisis in democracy now, what people really want to talk about is Brexit, but, because um, Brexit is really still happening. We don't, the, the exit hasn't happened. We don't know how it's going to look. That it, it, it's kind of ridiculous to really talk about Brexit as any one particular thing, but we could talk about it, um, and this is a great sentence from Andrew, as a kind of continuity. Um, when we think about Britain and the topic um, of immigration, which has been the kind of, coalescing factor, or at least the topic that most people think about when they think about Brexit. The, most of the discussions now and the debates within England about Brexit have to do with immigration. Um, and they're tied up with questions of xenophobia, nativism, race, nationalism. And there is a striking continuity between what's happening today and, and kind of the history of, of Britain and immigration throughout the 20th century, and it kind of makes sense um, to, to, to think about that continuity when, I guess, trying to understand what's happening here. Um, specifically between the relationship between um, politics and communication and the, and the media. Um, when Brexit happened in 2016, it, was, it seemed kind of natural for people to see it as a moment of real rupture and to think of it in terms of fascism. The Archbishop of Camp Canterbury, I think in 2017, responded to it by saying that this had been a kind of, a moment where Britain um, embraced kind of a right-wing, almost fascistic kind of politics. And um, and that would make sense. I mean, on the day, if people remember, I mean, on the day of Brexit, a Labour MP member was killed by somebody who was, I think, a bona fide Nazi. Um, and also a follower of people, of, of somebody called Anders Brevich, people remember he was the Norwegian Lord of Kings, um, and who was himself an anti-Semite and kind of a neo-Nazi. So, there were, so from the very beginning, Brexit and the result was tied to images of fascism and racism. And, um, and, as, and they have a kind of history to draw on. We had a, we had a, Tom took us through the history of fascism in Italy and, and Germany, and Britain also had its own kind of fascist party in the, the, in the 1930s with uh, Sir Osmond Mosley and the British Union of Fascists. And, um, and what was interesting back then is that they tried to justify, at least legitimize this kind of fascist um, party in the 1930s as a cosmopolitan and very, oh, it's okay, it's a very European ideology that we have here. Um, it's not backward looking, so they kind of pose themselves as some sort of, like I said, cosmopolitan, like more broad thinking. 
um, movement, but we're and we're actually supported early on by the media, the Daily Mail, the Sun. Um, we're sympathetic to the the, um, the the fascist party in Britain until it became violent and they um, kind of gave it up. But the question of immigration was always in, was kind of always embedded in um, in. Disputes in political disputes in in Britain, you know, since the, the 19th century, it was fundamental to the rise of fascism in the 1930s, and then after World War II, when um, when Commonwealth from individuals from Commonwealth countries were allowed to um, to to emigrate to England, it became an issue again. And um, in the late 1960s, you have conservative ministers like. You know, Powell giving what was called the kind of rivers of blood speech, who was saying many of the same things that you ended up hearing in the 1970s um, when Margaret Thatcher said that um, she was worried that with further immigration, uh, England would become swamped with foreign cultures. And, um, and the, at every one of these kind of flashpoints where immigration seems to be an issue, what you end up having is conservative, usually politicians, amplifying messages from the fringe, um, which are then kind of adapted and circulated um, by the media, um, which um, at, create these kind of crisis points. And you see a, you saw a very similar, I guess, um, dynamic occur with the rise of UKIP, um, in the 19, throughout the 1990s, but also um, throughout the early 2000s. And quickly, mainstream politicians adapted messages from the fringe um, and led the country down a course of basically accepting um, a, a, a kind of a myth about immigration in, in Britain that led to Brexit. You can see now that it's kind of difficult to think about this in terms of fascism because there's such a crisis of democracy of democracy actually functioning that um, the, the parties the parties themselves are divided from within um, and the entire the entire question of Brexit and what's going to happen is there going to be a deal or no deal is is, is completely confused but it's still confused around this question of immigration um, and and which I like I. Uh, had mentioned before, is a kind of an, an ongoing, long-term, and very contiguous problem within um, the British public that they that they seem to kind of return to over and over again. And it's it, what's interesting about this case is it's not always from the right wing. And it's, it's Labour and the left wing um, in in England is has dabbled in anti-immigration rhetoric um, just as often, just as frequently. So it's. You can see it as a kind of, um, from, if we're thinking about it in terms of demagoguery or if we're thinking about it in terms of populism, it's something that is, is um, at least in this context, not limited to kind of one end of the political spectrum. It's a, it's a dynamic that um, is kind of across the spectrum of, of British politics. Um, and why that's uh, so important is that we, it's really kind of unclear where that's going to head. In. It's, it's unclear where that's going to take the, um, either party um, into the future. Um, but I think I'm kind of going over here, so I'm going to pass it off to you. We can talk more about Brexit, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a very interesting uh, topic, uh, because I think this is exactly so. I'm going to talk about the case of France. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to relate on a few notes I've been taking. Um, because I think that what France is experiencing right now is uh, also connected to uh, uh, the European question uh, in terms of uh, policy and economy. And I think that the uh, democracy crisis um, so we're uh, uh, com confronted with right now, uh, not only in Europe, but certainly also in the United States, has something to do also with uh, uh, maybe the idea that neoliberalism is uh, uh, inseparable as an ideology, as a conception of the uh, exchange in values, of Values uh, with uh, the idea of democracy. 
so there is uh, something very interesting that I want to share with you. Um, it is this uh, yellow vest movement. Mm -hmm. And sure, uh, Emmanuel Macron appears as, uh, has a very good image uh, in, uh, in uh, at least in English speaking countries. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but so there is a very different reality, and, uh, and, and I would like maybe to focus on, uh, uh, I mean, to be able to. Go down on the ground and, and, and take very factual elements uh, that are, in my opinion, interesting and that might lead to discussion um, uh, after that. So, the, the few elements uh, I wanted to expose briefly are related to the, this current state of disruption that uh, France is experiencing since the last 13 weeks with uh, the Yellow Vest movement. Mm -hmm. And this is something unprecedented in the, in, in, in the recent history of France. Uh, the last time we have been confronted to that, uh, that was in. May uh, 1968 uh, with the riots and the social movement of that time, uh, something that led to um, a referendum that has been proposed by the uh, former French president, uh, the General de Gaulle, uh, and um, a refusal uh, from the French population of the constitutional reforms that the French president at that time wanted. So uh, this led to his resignation in uh, April uh, 1968. Um, so, there is a very important aspect that was um, uh, raised uh, by uh, Tom Hall uh, before. This is the idea that uh, um, the best world government is not to be contested. And this is what happens with, uh, uh, with Emmanuel Macron right now. Uh, this contestation has deeper roots in the French recent history and imaginary um, and found a ground in a demand for more uh, structural social justice and a severe reassessment of neoliberal values that have fundamentally prevailed in the country since 1983. Uh, that means with the, the so-called uh, tournant de la rigueur, the, the austerity twist uh, that has been uh, taken by François Mitterrand, who was a, um, a socialist uh, president, uh, and who has been uh, fundamentally uh, influenced by the neoconservative revolution that was steered by uh, Ronald Reagan in the United States and uh, Margaret Thatcher in, in the UK. Uh, so maybe to uh, try to identify how the will to impose a certain series of neoliberal values might lead within the democratic frame to authoritarian uh, 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 way of governing, um, I would try maybe to come back to uh, elements that have been um, spoken before uh, about uh, um, what is what is what is fundamentally fascism. It relates to to various authoritarian and ethnic policies that can be upheld by a person detaining the sovereignty of the country, imposing at once a null mightiness of the state, a repressive apparatus structured by a, a political police, for instance, a predominance of executive power over the legislative, and an exaltation of nationality. So if we look at uh, the definition of democracy, uh, as in Greek, uh, demos and kratos, the, the people rule, this system implies that the supreme power is determined by the people and exercised by them. Uh, this system doesn't exclude the danger or the possibility of a failing into fascist modes of governance by delegating the supreme power into the hands of an individual or a group deceptively embodying the nation through violent means. So, and, and, and there is a quote from Anna Arendt um, in The Origins of Totalitarianism where she writes, uh, Mussolini's fascism, which up to 1938 was not totalitarian, but just an ordinary nationalist dictatorship, developed logically from a multi-party democracy. So if we want to understand the, the possible origins of the popular insurrection that is holding sway in France uh, right now, as well as the multiple outcomes that this movement might find, we must question first how distorted and increasingly meaningless the political discourse it means uh, basically the use of words and language, has progressively appeared to the eyes of millions of people for many reasons. Precisely first because, as it occurred through the election of Donald Trump in the United States, the traditional Republican right, uh, uh, right-wing party has recycled behind the moral curtains of democracy, the identity and national discourses of far-right parties in order to absorb more voters. Um, a discourse that precisely segregates citizens following their race, gender, and culture within one nation, creating through that mean a hierarchical perception of citizenship. Uh, this use and conception of democracy equates a logic of supply and demand where words are drained from any semantic content. 
uh, this dynamic uh, led to very peculiar situations where such figure as uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, who was French president from 2007 until 2012, held speeches where he celebrated um, the republican and democratic values of his right-wing parties, uh, connecting to the alleged universalist French motto, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, while at the same time stigmatizing religious and ethnic communities such as the French Muslims, uh, the Roma, and focusing on alleged security and immigration issues. Uh, when we're talking about immigration issues in France, you have to know that uh, we're speaking about a movement of, for instance, each year of 200,000 people. But when we speak about that, we don't speak about the people that are also at the same time living in the country. So it means that the reality in a, in a nation of 70 million people is to absorb uh, uh, a number of so-called foreigners that is around 60 or 70,000 people. And that should be an issue in a strong uh, uh, nation with a strong economy. Uh, so there is a way of manipulating those topics for other issues. So we see that the language uh, is uh, the, the ethical approach of the language in politics is incredibly important because this is a way of distorting uh, or creating a diversion uh, for the community. Um, so the right populist momentum has potentially endangered a certain conception and approach of what we call democracy in the public opinion, fundamentally by uh, following the, the Carl Schmitt political um, and religious notion of the, the friend and the enemy. And the same distortions have developed from the economic and political heights with uh, uh, someone like François Hollande, uh, French president from 2012 to 2017. Uh, he was stemming from the, the Socialist Party, which is now actually a center uh, party that is almost inexistent since uh, 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 the arrival of uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, who has been able to erase the boundaries between the right and the left. Uh, and Hollande declared at, at, during his campaign at that time that he was, he declared that to the uh, national uh, English newspaper, The Guardian, that he was a strong adversary of finance economy. Um, this has been taken seriously by a lot of uh, French um, uh, voters who wanted to have um, uh, a twist and uh, wanted to um, create a rupture with uh, uh, the policy of Nicolas Sarkozy in France at that time. Um, the problem is that so François Hollande has simply been following uh, a neoliberal economy that was very close to uh, the right wing, uh, neoconservative movement. And he was just following of the European treaties. So there is a very, uh, the, the problem in Europe uh, is not only a problem that exists on a national level, but something that exists on, um, is, is a multi-directional issue uh, since European treaties are contradicting uh, the economic sovereignty of each European country that has a very different, uh, very uh, different diverse sociological and economical situation. So France is not Germany, is not Italy, is not Great Britain, is not Spain. And we see that those European treaties have, are making no distinction. There is no social or economic harmonization uh, through those European treaties. So these treaties are very problematic uh, in, a, in an objective manner in terms of democracy. But the problem is that at the same time, far-right movements <coughs> are using these aspects to, to, to be more uh, perceivable in the public. Um, so we can uh, relate to someone else. Uh, the, uh, I'm thinking about the theorist uh, Chantal Mouffe, um, that her itinerary said the democratic paradox that uh, the, the strategies of ideological disentanglement uh, or the, the attempt to erase the boundaries between the right and the left, something that appeared in, in Great Britain uh, very strongly, as successful with uh, Tony Blair, uh, who was inspired by uh, Anthony Giddens. Uh, this has led to uh, um, a, a democratic crisis where boundaries are not any more perceivable, where ideology doesn't, doesn't have any sense any longer. Um, and the only element that has been, that remained, was the idea that democracy can only uh, be based on, on neoliberalism. Uh, that, and, and people like Adam Kotzko, for instance, or um, George Agamben have been thinking about this almost theological, political theological aspect of neoliberalism nowadays. It means that, uh, if you are contradicting neoliberalism, you are you are not realistic. Uh, you are at uh, you are brought at the margin of reality. If you are const contesting that, you are a demagogue, or you are a populist. So words can be used.
that matter. And that's, that's a problem. And the relation with the, um, uh, the, the, the Yelavis movement is the following. We are confronted to a movement, a, a, a very strong uh, uh, popular movement that is asking for more popular sovereignty and the possibility to go back to the real meaning of democracy. But the power, the actual government, has been trying to discredit uh, this movement uh, by calling them anti-Semitic, uh, homophobic, uh, uh, lawbreakers. And this popular movement that is putting in question the actual uh, government um, is confronted to something very specific. The actual democratic government that has been democrati democratically elected is trying to impose bill draft uh, related to uh, the right to demonstrate. The right to demonstrate in France is constitutional. Uh, that's a major issue. Something else in this authoritarian excesses that we're experiencing, we see right now uh, that um, the legal system is being exploited by uh, uh, the government to get access to sources of journalists. Uh, very recently, three days ago, uh, a very famous and serious uh, news site called Mediapart uh, uh, has been receiving the visit of uh, a judge uh, mandated by the state and of police forces uh, to get access to uh, sources and information that might be an issue for the power right now. So, um, another issue related to that in the news of the, the legal system against the opposition. This is also what the, uh, the left opposition has been experiencing, uh, a movement called La France Insoumise, which is equivalent to uh, Podemos in Spain, uh, uh, has received the same kind of threat. Uh, they have been searched, uh, and, uh, searched uh, uh, by a hundred police officers and judges that came to the private uh, places of uh, opponents, of political opponents. So this is a, a, a very problematic aspect that we're experiencing when I win the friends of the democracy. Uh, so the question that came to my mind with that uh, is um, our collective responsibility towards those events. It means, uh, are we in a democracy only based on the fact that we're able to vote? Uh, I think this is uh, the main question uh, that appears to me. Why? And I'm going to end with, uh, with that. Um, Emmanuel Macron has been elected not based on a massive desire from the French nation. He has been elected because there was a far-right proto-fascist threat in, uh, in, uh, embodied by uh, Marine Le Pen and, and her movement. So, uh, but the use that Emmanuel Macron has been doing of, of uh, the democratic France at his disposal and of the Fifth Republic Constitution has led to authoritarian maneuvers from this side. And we see, you know, there is this very famous uh, 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 quote uh, that, uh, that comes from one of his uh, diaries from the Bertolt Brecht, who says that sometimes uh, authoritarian movements or fascism comes through the democracy. And this was certainly true uh, in, in Germany. So I'm not trying to make equalities between Macron, fascism, and Nazis, because they are very different aspects. But authoritarian excesses and, uh, uh, are very possible in democracy and might open the door to other realities uh, 